policymakers, and advocating for comprehensive energy reform. SAFE has done extraordinary work in getting the energy security agenda on energy security issue on the public agenda, thanks in part to its dynamic and strategic founder, SAFE's president, CEO, Robbie Diamond, who is with us today. In 2006, under Robbie's leadership, SAFE formed the Energy Security Leadership Council, a group of business and military leaders committed to reducing U.S. oil dependence. The very distinguished leaders on the Energy Security Leadership Council includes four men who are with us today. All are former Marines who care deeply about our country and its future, both our national security and our energy security. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce them by the order in which they're seated. Frederick W. Smith, Chairman, President, and CEO of the FedEx Corporation, and Co-Chairman of Securing America's Future Energy, Energy Security Leadership Council. FedEx, Fred Smith needs no introduction in Washington. Let me just say, neither does FedEx, but let me do that nonetheless. FedEx is a $32 billion global transportation and logistics company serving 220 countries with 260,000 employees, 677 aircraft, 70,000 vehicles to handle more than 6 million shipments per business day. Fred Smith is known as a proponent of free markets and free trade and serves on the board of our sister organization, you can say the Cato Institute, among other organizations. Bob Lutz, the former vice chairman of the General Motors Corporation. Robert Lutz's 47-year career in the auto industry made him a legend, largely focused on product development that included senior leadership positions at General Motors, Ford, Chrysler and BMW, and culminating in being the Vice Chairman of General Motors. General James Conway, retired, the 34th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. General, General Conway, as Commandant, served as a member of the Joint Chiefs in the culmination of a 40-year, extraordinarily distinguished career in active duty. Under his leadership, the Marine Corps grew to over 250,000 active, reserve, and civilian personnel, which he was responsible for organizing, equipping, and training. And he was especially known for bringing in next generation weapon systems into the Marine Corps. Lastly, General P.X. Kelly, the 28th Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, and the co-chairman of the Energy Security Leadership Council. In General Kelly's extraordinarily distinguished 37-year military career, which ended in 1987, he commanded Marine Corps organizations at every echelon, from platoon through division, was the youngest Marine ever to be made a general and also served as a member of the Joint Chiefs. Gentlemen, all four of you have been leaders all your lives, and we're particularly honored that you are continuing to be leaders, <coughs> taking up the future national security of our country in a new way. Following their opening uh, remarks, which will come in the form of responses to questions, these four individual, distinguished individuals have graciously agreed to take questions uh, from the audience. As moderator, I will begin by asking some questions of our panelists before turning it over to our conference center audience here for questions and answers. You can also submit questions via Twitter. Please send them to us at Hudson Institute. Now, one last uh, note by way of introduction. I should note, uh, lastly, how pleased we are to be working with SAFE. SAFE and Hudson are very different kinds of organizations, but I think it is significant today that we are working together to promote dialogue on energy and public policy. SAFE is a policy organization dedicated to U.S. energy security and has produced a number of constructive proposals to address those challenges. And you can learn more about SAFE at secureenergy.org. Hudson Institute is a future and market-oriented policy research organization with some diversity of viewpoints on energy policy, to uh, put it in the least. Though our scholars are unanimous in supporting various forms of deregulation <coughs> to promote further energy exploration, Hudson does not take institutional positions and our scholars' views differ in numerous ways. From Erwin Stelzer's support of a tax on imported oil to Lee Lane's belief that a significant number of the ex economic externalities associated with oil are already captured by the current gas tax. And Chris Sands looks at industrial policy in the auto industry and why it has not yet solved our energy problems sustainably. New papers on energy by Erwin Stelzer and Lee Lane are available at Hudson.org and Chris's paper is forthcoming. Let me say that by way of introduction. Let me turn first now over to uh, Fred Smith. This is a very distinguished group of individuals we have up here, all of whom have come together to talk about improving our nation's energy security. Fred, how would you say our nation's 
energy is insecure today? Well, Ken, first uh, let me um, uh, update a couple of numbers there. FedEx, uh, I think we sent you a bad uh, uh, earlier bio. FedEx about a $43 billion uh, company that operates about 95,000 trucks. And uh, the reason I emphasize the number of vehicles that we operate, and of, of course your, your figure on the airplanes are pretty close, but what's happened is they've gotten bigger over time. It's the biggest wide body fleet in the world. We came to this issue a long time ago. Uh, when FedEx was first beginning operations in 1973, uh, in short order, uh, we were faced with the first Arab oil embargo in the fall of 1973, where in uh, response to uh, U.S. actions uh, in the Middle East to support Israel, uh, oil was withheld from the market and the United States had uh, begun to be a significant importer of of oil, and the government had to allocate uh, oil to individual users, so we were almost uh, killed in our cradle by the first uh, modern oil crisis. For 40 years we've watched it, and uh, the significance is, uh, over this period of time, is that every single major economic <coughs> contraction uh, or recession the United States has experienced, including the sub prime meltdown was either coincident with or precipitated by a significant run-up in, in fuel prices. Beginning in the 21st century, however, the landscape changed uh, as a result of the United States imports of its petroleum needs reaching almost 60 percent at the zenith and um, the emergence of China and India as uh, uh, increasing uh, users of, of petroleum as they had large percentages of their population moving into the middle class and wanting to have the same uh, lifestyle that, that we did. So it has become over the last uh, several years after nuclear proliferation and the weapons of mass destruction issue, the largest single national security and national economic risk that the United States faces. Uh, the Energy Security Leadership Council um, is an organization, as you noted, that's composed of four-star generals and admirals and CEOs of companies like FedEx that use a great deal of energy. We use over a billion five hundred million gallons per year, to put that in perspective. And we uh, felt that uh, the United States did not have a strategic policy regarding uh, energy and that the failure to, to have a strategic policy uh, could lead the United States into a very significant uh, confrontation. And we came up with five recommendations, which I'll recount and then turn the floor back over to you to set the stage, as to what the United States should do to reduce its dependence on imported petroleum, for which we paid last year 320 some odd billion dollars, representing 58% of the U.S. Uh, balance of payments deficit. And many of those dollars, of course, went to countries which uh, wish us ill, uh, whose values are not the same in the United States, but who control the all oil markets through <clears throat> a cartel. <clears throat> Our recommendations transcend political labels. Number one, it was to maximize United States oil and gas production in whatever manner uh, feasible. Number two was to diversify transportation uh, power uh, by electrifying as rapidly as possible short haul and light duty uh, transportation coincident with the vast improvements in lithium battery technology. Three, to uh, utilize natural gas as a power uh, supply for heavy duty over the road and centrally fuel vehicles. Four, 
to uh, reinstitute fuel efficiency standards for automobiles, which was done in 2007 under the Bush administration, and last continue biofuel research in an attempt to, to come up with cost-effective, scalable uh, biofuels. So that sets the stage, I think, for the recommendations of the ESLC that uh, you may want to discuss. Yeah. Before we get to the recommendations, let me, let me, let's go back you know, for a moment to the, to the <coughs> national security issue, and then we'll turn back to the, uh, to the recommendations. Well, let, me, let me ask General uh, Conway uh, about uh, how he would characterize the, uh, the, the national security implications of our dependence on oil, in particular, the military's role in uh, protecting vulnerable global oil supplies. Uh, Ken, let me, let me answer your question by, by giving just a brief history of our evolution to dependence on foreign oil. Uh, in 1936, shortly before World War II, the United States produced 99% of its own requirement. Uh, by 1986, when I was a young major and visited the Middle East for the first time with, uh, with one of our chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, we went aboard the command ship. At that point, the commander in the Middle East was a Navy two-star and he and his entire staff were embarked aboard the USS LaSalle. At that point, our requirement uh, for foreign oil was about 27%. Today, as, uh, as Fred mentioned, it's somewhere between 50 and 60%. And it's that impact uh, on our nation, and particularly our nation's economy, our nation's decision making, uh, that puts us at risk. The problem is our enemies recognize that. Uh, and it is the, the strategy, the philosophy of, uh, of extremists who, would, who have attacked our country and, and want to continue to do so. Uh, they, they, they believe that uh, they can not beat us in the field, but that they can virtually bring us to our knees through manipulation, uh, control, destruction, uh, having impact uh, on, on oil supply and its cost to this nation. Uh, to the degree that they can, in terms, bankrupt us, uh, that would then make us unable to react. And I'm not just talking about us, I'm talking about Western Europe as well. So it is that potential for manipulation that causes us concern from a national security perspective. And I can assure you, because I've, I've been there, when the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff sit around the table and talk about various options uh, in any scenario these days that involves the Middle East, high on the considerations as you look at courses of action are, are impact on our, our national economic picture. That has never been the case before. Previously, that's always been sort of a, a side concern that we would have as military men. Someone else will worry about those factors. But today, it is front and center. Uh, now, uh, you should never, I guess, cite a problem without at least offering a, a recommendation. And in addition to the things that, that Fred has talked about, I think as Americans, we've got to demand that our country, our, our national legislators come together uh, with a national energy strategy. Uh, policies, in my mind, live as long as the policymakers. I think there has to be a uniform strategy that all sides of the issue can agree upon, necessarily through compromise, but that we can all agree upon that will take us for the next 10 or 20 years to where we need to go. Uh, it's, got to, it's got to transcend administrations, and uh, until that happens, I think we'll continue to bounce about with uh, a few policies, a few well-intentioned uh, types of efforts, but we won't get to where we need to be in this transition period. Let me ask you, if we do get to the energy security that, uh, that, uh, we, that is so desired, can we really abandon the mission that we have in terms of protecting global power? No, I don't think we'll ever do that. Uh, we are a global power. Uh, we will continue, I think, as, as the primary nation amongst, amongst all global powers uh, at protecting uh, the sea lanes uh, and, and international commerce. It's in our best interest, it's in the best interest of the world to do that. Uh, it's a responsibility that we have evolved to over time, really, I guess, since, uh, since the end of World War II. I don't think that's going to change much, uh, and I don't think our countrymen want it to change much. I know certainly American business is very comfortable with us being there. Uh, it, it also brings aboard a lot of other uh, values, I think, uh, that come with it, uh, not least of which is, is just uh, the presence and the engagement uh, with, uh, with our friends and allies across the globe. So the United States military will always be a global military, and I think it's, it's the price we're going to have to pay for that kind of influence. General Kelly, let me ask you, uh, you, were a, you were critical to the creation of CENTCOM, and you saw something clearly decades ago that others didn't. Would you care to say a few words about the creation of CENTCOM? 
Would you say that again? Uh, would you uh, say a few words about the creation of Sensecom mm -hmm. and your role in it? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, as some of you may, may recall, when we were um, considering Sensecom, Sensecom actually started when Harold Brown realized that we did not have a worldwide force, a force that could go globally when, as the crises developed in a worldwide basis. It soon narrowed down because of circumstances going on in the world today. It soon <coughs> narrowed down to the Middle East. But mean, meanwhile, um, in searching for a commander of the Central Command, uh, after a lot of due diligence in the, um, in the Pentagon, uh, and one story which I do like to tell, that when uh, my name was mentioned to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he uh, didn't know me, and he said, um, he'd like to meet me. So I uh, went over on a Sunday morning, and his secretary was there in his office, and I told her I was here to see the chairman, and she said, well, he's over in the White House. And I said, well, how long is he going to be there? And she said, well, I, I really don't know. Why do you have a problem? I said, well, quite frankly, I do. And she said, would you mind telling me what it is? I said, no, not really, uh, but I'll tell you. It's, um, it's I promised my granddaughter I was going to take her to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs at 2 o'clock, and by God, I'm going to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs <laughs> at 2 o'clock. So uh, the chairman did find out that and thought that was, uh, was rather humorous. But, but go, going back a bit, uh, I had a tour for a year uh, with the Royal Marines where I was a commanding officer. Actually, I think probably historically, I was the full commander of a Royal Marine company in a commando unit that was stationed in Aden. I think some of you probably know where Aden is, but Aden is a center, or was a center uh, element for Middle East oil. And the facility in Aden was actually a Royal Marine facility, and I was the assistant operations officer of four or five commando Royal Marines, and our job was to protect the oil that was in Aden, which was considerable, and also one of the, uh, the main arteries, so to speak, of the, uh, the U.S., or rather the uh, Royal Navy operations in the Middle East. But going back to Central Command, uh, that started out really as a worldwide command. And the first thing that struck me was the fact that the, uh, the, there was no central f facility, no focus on the Middle East. It was worldwide, but it wasn't in the Middle East. And that is a time when the Middle East was really starting to flare up, as you may recall. So with, with that said, when we started to do our planning for the Middle East, we realized that we're talking about an 8,000 mile zone between U.S. facilities and the Middle East, 8,000 miles where the airplanes had to go and, and ships had to go, and this was a tremendous demand on, on oil because that was the only option that we in fact did have. When we started to do our planning then, we, we realized that this was a bigger problem than just having a small little force for the Middle East. So that's when we started the wheels mo in motion for the European Command, or rather the Central Command. And uh, that's what sort of the history of Central Command, was the fact that we had no unified commander actually in response that was responsible for the Middle East. In fact, the people who were in the Middle East were reporting through, through um, to the senior commander in Europe, which is a totally unworkable situation. So with that, so that was the birth then of Central Command, which you know, as you as know today, is the command that's in the Middle East and responsible fully for the Middle East. Thank you, General. We're, we're gonna shift gears now, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, ask a question to Bob Lutz to focus on this issue of electrification, which uh, Fred Smith noted is one of the five uh, policy aims of uh, the Energy uh, Leadership Council. Uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit about why you and GM chose to, to build the Volt? Uh, what, when, what the future looks for cars like these? Obviously, this, this, is, this uh, vehicle in particular has received significant amount of criticism, particularly from uh, political conservatives, uh, as we noted earlier today in our uh, 
discussion. And uh, many say the government shouldn't be involved in this kind of technology. Many question the readiness of this new technology. What's, what's your message to, to, to skeptics like this? Well, let me, let me start with uh, popular misconceptions about the Chevrolet Volt. Uh, those of you who listen to conservative radio or watch Fox News or listen to O'Reilly or uh, Neil Cavuto will believe that the Chevrolet Volt catches fire a lot. Um, it consumed $53 billion for only 6,000 built. Uh, was a product of the Obama administration when in fact it is none of those things. Um, Chevrolet Volt was conceived largely, um, it's a very self-serving comment, but largely by me because it was a very promising technology which would link all of the advantages of the elect purely electric vehicle, which is 40 miles with no fuel consumption whatsoever, with the ultimate range of a conventional car uh, with beyond the beyond the depletion range of the battery, an internal com small internal combustion engine would provide uh, electricity to the battery for about another 300 miles. So it seemed like the ideal solution, where for most daily trips you can be electrical, but if you have to go long distances, you're not limited by range. We had a concept car at the Detroit Auto Show in January 2007 and history will show that Obama was elected in November of 2008. So, um, in fact, um, an interesting fact when um, in the post-subprime meltdown and uh, $4.50 gasoline uh, environment in the latter part of 2008 when the American automobile market went from a going rate of 16 million a year down to 8 million a year, and uh, General Motors and Chrysler both had to go Chapter 11. Um, at that point, when the Obama task force came in for the restructuring in early 2009, uh, the Obama task force, in fact, um, recommended that the Chevy Volt program be dropped as uh, somewhat too capital intensive, um, not a good enough payback on invested capital, and it was a marginal business proposition. And it was, in fact, those of us at General Motors who argued, no, we should not drop this vehicle. This vehicle is the future. This is the, the vehicle that te can technologically leapfrog the Toyota Prius and uh, paves the way to the future. And uh, th those of you who are interested in this stuff, uh, we are probably a couple of months away from BMW announcing the i3, which is Volt technology. Um, they actually hired most of the Volt team to do it. Uh, Audi is going to introduce the Audi e-tronic, again, a car with a, an electric range supplemented by battery. Volvo's going to have one. Uh, um, uh, Mercedes is going to have one. In other words, this, this technology is going to become generalized. <clears throat> now, uh, it is, but to me, the unfortunate thing is that uh, because electric cars are very closely associated with the left-wing environmental green movement and to combat global warming and reduce CO2, uh, the, the idea of vehicle electrification triggers this visceral reaction on the part of conservatives, which is, if it's electric, it must be a product of the democratic left-wing enviro-political machine. Therefore, we hate it. Uh, this is an unfortunate knee-jerk reaction because what the Volt and other vehicles like it are about is and this is the first generation, we're in a period of transition, but what these vehicles are about is shifting portions of the American mobile sector onto a uh, more efficient and domestically produced power source. And in conjunction with a lot of other measures, and as uh, Fred Smith likes to say, we're, we're for everything, we're for more drilling, we're for use of coal, we're for use of, uh, much more use of natural gas. We're for all of the things that can be, that, that are domestic <coughs> resource and can reduce America's dependence on uh, imported petroleum products. Uh, one of those components is the electrification of the automobile, which makes all kinds of sense. 
uh, and will make increasing sense in another five years when the cost of batteries and the technology will come way, way down. So it's part of, it's an important part of the overall mosaic of energy efficiency and by the way, reduced cost of driving because uh, driving an electric vehicle costs a fraction of a petroleum powered vehicle. So um, my, my plea to the right, and I have written emails to Rush Limbaugh, who likes to describe me as my good friend Bob Lutz, um, although I never get an email response from him. Uh, Bill O'Reilly, who wanted me on the show and I couldn't go because I'm a CNBC contributor. But um, all of these people, uh, I find, frustrate me in the unwillingness uh, to accept that uh, the, uh, electrification of the mobile sector is a good thing to do and in the national interest, whether you're a conservative or, uh, or, or a liberal. Uh, one final thing on the vault, many of you have heard that they catch fire. My intellectual idol, Charles Krauthammer, whom we'll be, we'll be seeing later, uh, has described the Chevy Volt as the flammable Chevrolet Volt, uh, thus perpetuating the fiction that um, electric vehicles in general and the Chevy Volt catch fire. Uh, in fact, one Chevrolet Volt caught fire in a government crash test which totally destroyed the vehicle. <laughs> the vehicle caught fire three weeks after the test, and I would say three weeks allows adequate time for survivors to exit the vehicle. <laughs> Other than that, no Chevrolet Volt has ever caught fire. But as we speak, there are three vehicle brands that where NHTSA has issued recall notices or asked the manufacturers to issue recall notices or they're under investigation where meanwhile the customers are asked to park the vehicles outside, do not place vehicle in your garage, do not place vehicle close to other vehicles. One is German, one is a Jeep, and one I'm sad to say is a Chevrolet, but they're all internal combustion conventional cars, one of which catches fire in the United States every 120 seconds, 275,000 a year. So, you know, where's the outrage? No electric vehicle has ever caught fire, and yet, uh, the political right is constantly talking about the flammability, overheating, fire hazard, and so forth of electric electric vehicle. And it's a, it's a, I, folks, it's a pure fiction. Please get it out of your heads. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me turn now back to uh, Fred Smith. Uh, in outlining the uh, the uh, the Energy Leadership Council's uh, policy agenda. You're known as a uh, champion of deregulation and free markets, mentioned you're a trustee of the Cato Institute. What kind <coughs> of actions do you think are justified in this area, and uh, how do you justify the cost? Well, I'm an erstwhile uh, m a member of the Cato board, but you're exactly right. I'm a conservative, and I definitely believe uh, in the main in free market uh, solutions. The problem with the, the oil market is that it's not a free market. The oil market is, is controlled by OPEC, uh, and OPEC is a, is a cartel which owns some place close to 90% of the proven oil reserves in the world. Uh, it meets a couple of times a year to set the price of oil. Even though they own this tremendous uh, amount of the world's proven resources, although we're we're, we're starting to find uh, significant additional reserves because of this new uh, exploration technology that's been developed here. But the OPEC nations produce about 42% of the, of the oil used by the world each year. So think about that. They own 80 to 90% of the reserves and they produce 42%. That's not classical economics. They're not maximizing their economic uh, return. In fact, it, there's an intellectual fight between the Saudi Arabians who want to keep the price of oil at a level which doesn't incent people to develop alternatives uh, but maximizes their income. They need about $94, $95 a barrel in Saudi Arabia to, to make their social payments these days. That's not my figures, that's the 
the Saudi government's figures, uh, the Iranians would like to uh, run the price up as, as high as possible in order to, to hurt the West, particularly during this period of, of time uh, when the West has uh, put sanctions on the Iranian uh, regime. Uh, in 2001, the average American family spent about $1,700 on uh, fuel. Last year, that figure was about $4,000 per family. A huge fight took place as we all watched uh, in, in Congress uh, over whether the payroll tax would be reduced in 2011 and then uh, continued into 2012. The value of that reduction to the American public in 2011 was about $110 billion. The cost to the American public of the increased price in fuel in 2011 was about $110 billion. So the increased price of fuel served as a tax that took the increased economic activity, our increase in GFG, NP and put uh, at least half of it into the, the hands of, of people who supply us, uh, supply us oil. The geopolitical issues surrounding oil have been going on a long time. We talked earlier in the day, but people forget it. The causes belli between Japan and the United States was when we embargoed their oil supplies from Indonesia. The uh, famous battle of the uh, Germans versus the Russians in Stalingrad was about oil. The Germans had gone to Stalingrad to interdict the oil coming up the Volga River that supplied Stalin's armies. The biggest air raid that the United States ever conducted uh, up to that time, and certainly the most heroic, was to try to knock out the oil refineries in Ploesti. The 1990 uh, war in Iraq was clearly about oil. Uh, Osama bin Laden declared war on the United States. Nobody paid much attention to it when he did it. And I think 1998, because of the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia, they've been left there after the first Gulf War. So the United States has gotten ourselves into a position where importing now a little bit less, thank goodness, because of these improved technology, we are still dependent for half of our oil from uh, foreign sources. So the only way that we can prevent the United States from being taxed, if you will, every time we have any type of, of economic growth by increased oil prices that are set by a cartel that would not be legally possible if it were operating inside the United States is to diversify our fuel supply along the lines that we, we mentioned. So even though I'm a conservative and I support free market principles, this is not a free market problem. It is a military and national security problem and it should be looked in, at in the same vein as if we're buying another couple of squadrons of F-35s or another aircraft carrier. And the profundity of the technology that Bob has talked about this lithium ion battery technology which is on a, a very good clip to, to become self-sustaining on its own. It is in our best interest as a nation to do all of those things that the Energy Security Leadership Council has recommended lest we get into another military conflagration over this issue. Let me ask you a, a follow-up in, in this area about uh, alternative uh, new alternative energy sources or new energy sources, given the uh, the recent boom in domestic oil and natural gas production, do you, do you, do you, is it is it simply not possible for natural gas to meet the growing needs that we see to improve our energy security sufficiently? Or do, you, do you think the why is electrification so critical? Well, it's it's not just electrification. Remember, I mentioned five things: one, maximize U.S. oil and gas production in every possible way, in Alaska, off both coasts, in the Gulf, uh, in, on federal lands, uh, we need to maximize indigenous U.S. oil and gas production. Then I also mentioned electrification for light duty uh, personal and, and uh, commercial vehicles, 
the use of natural gas for heavy over the road and centrally uh, fuel vehicles, uh, renewed um, uh, fuel efficiency standards, and continued research on biofuels. So you need to do all five of those. In the case of natural gas and electrification, they both get at the fundamental problem about our uh, oil use and our, our consumption of oil. And by the way, President Eisenhower, when he was in office, and he knew a thing or two about national security, said it would be a national security emergency if we imported over 15% of our oil needs. And at one point, as I mentioned just a few years ago, we were up to 60%. But here's the issue in a nutshell. <clears throat> oil is basically transportation. Of the slightly now under 19 million barrels a day that we burn uh, per day, about 20% of the world demand, 70% of it's transportation. And of the 70% of oil used in transportation, uh, you have to recognize that somewhere around 97% uh, is powered by oil. The light duty sector is by far the biggest single user of petroleum. Uh, it represents somewhere around 10 million of our daily consumption. The heavy over the road vehicles represent somewhere around three million barrels a day. So let me give you some gee whiz numbers here. We have 250 million light duty vehicles in the United States. That's personal automobiles and uh, the small trucks that Coca-Cola, Verizon, AT&T uh, might use. If you could wave a magic wand and convert all of them to battery powered and recharge those uh, every night, there is enough energy capability, productive capability in our existing power plant system to refuel every one of those vehicles every night. And they can be done in an off-peak tap. Now, there are lots of details here. There are transformers in the right neighborhood and having the 220 like you have for your washing machine in the right place to power your vehicle. But the trajectory that Bob Lutz knows a lot better than, than I do of these lithium ion batteries is going to give us the potential over the next 10 to 15 years along with fuel efficiency standards that we could take that 10 million barrels a day that we use for light duty trucks and personal automobiles and cut it at least in half. To, to 5 million barrels a day or less. Of the 4 million barrels a day used in the heavy truck <laughs> sector, conversion of a great percentage of it over to natural gas, which is now possible because the engine manufacturers are beginning to come out with 12 liter and 15 liter engines, which are economical, we could potentially cut that in half and the, the uh, equivalent price of a diesel gallon represented by liquid natural gas today is almost two dollars per gallon less. So it isn't just the one thing. It's doing all of these in order to eliminate the national security and economic <laughs> risks the country faces. And I'll just close with this. We're sitting reading the headlines every day about the deliberations of the Israelis and, and our government and the Europeans about what to do with the Iranian nuclear situation. If the Strait of Hormuz was shut, through which 17 million barrels of oil go per day, I don't think that they can do it based on what I understand, but let's just say somehow that happened. There is no question that the price of oil in the United States would go well above $200 per barrel. The price of fuel at the pump would go from $3.75, $4 a gallon to $7, $7.50 per gallon. The 7% of our GDP that we now spend for petroleum would shoot up to 10 or 12%, and I can assure you that we would have an economic contraction that would make the one that we just gone through seem like a twin, twin sister or twin brother. So we have to deal with this issue as a strategic military and geopolitical issue that cannot be solved in the short run just by domestic 
production. It has to be a part of the equation and we support all of it, but it's going to take us doing all of those things and not be on the right or the left about this, but to be an American about the problem. Let me turn it to uh, General Conway for a second to comment on uh, your remarks about <coughs> Iran and the uh, future of uh, U.S. Uh, energy security. Yeah, well, Fred, Fred's exactly right, and the figures, I think, should scare us all. That's, that 17 million a day constitutes 20 percent of the world's oil supply. And, uh, you know, I honestly think that the situation with Iran uh, is the wolf closest to our sled. Uh, happily, there are negotiations taking place right now. Uh, I'm pessimistic about their outcome. Uh, frankly, uh, because I think you'll see delay and, and, and probably very little tangible result. Uh, you know, Iran has said that they want to develop uh, a nuclear capability so that they have sustained energy over time. Uh, that's like saying Eskimos need freezers because they've got more energy right now than they, than they know what to do with and will have for, for generations to come. We have said that that position is unacceptable uh, for them to have nuclear weapons because terrorism is a recognized uh, element of national power uh, from an Iranian perspective, and, and 33 other nations of the world agree with us on that. So I'm afraid we're headed uh, towards confrontation. Um, and I think there is a window of time uh, here for negotiation, but it's a window that's closing rapidly. Because the Israelis, uh, we see the, the issue as a problem. The Israelis see it as existential uh, to the survival of their nation. And, uh, you know, the, the unfortunate part is if they do attack, it will be with American-made planes dropping American-made bombs, and they'll defend Israel with American-made patriot systems. So whether or not we attack, we'll be perceived as being a vital part of all that takes place. And in many ways, we don't, we don't need another war, but we could be pulled into one, uh, honestly, through the actions of, of another nation. Um, options available to us in the, in the near term, limited attack. Will delay, but it will not stop an Iranian program uh, in, in, in the process. We poke the tiger. A full-scale attack uh, is a regime change, I guess, is always an option, but Tehran's a long way from anywhere. There aren't any beaches close to Tehran. And so it would be long, it would be bloody. Uh, tens of thousands of Iranians would die, and thousands of young Americans and others, I suspect, would join us, uh, would also find that uh, a very difficult task. Um, you know, there's a third option, I guess, and that's changed from within, but I think the window for that opened and closed a couple of years ago, and uh, we did not take advantage, potentially, of, of uh, unrest inside the country that, that might have helped us to offset the problem. If, uh, if Iran, uh, let, me, let me put it like this, if I were an Iranian general giving my best military advice to the Ayatollah uh, or Aminajad, it would be, hey, uh, don't overtly close the straits because the American Navy will kill us. But if we simply have a mine adrift out there every once in a while, uh, or an undisclosed attack uh, that sinks a tanker or two uh, in that gulf, which is in our backyard, the insurance companies will do the rest. And we will start this effort of bringing the West to its knees uh, through gas prices in our country, probably in excess of $10 a gallon. So uh, there are a lot of tools that they have. Uh, that, that, again, can be used to manipulate us in ways that uh, it, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty challenging just to think about. Well, on that ominous note, let's uh, open it to the uh, audience for questions, and we'll begin with uh, my colleague, uh, Erwin Stelzer, who is the Director of Economic uh, Studies here at Hudson. Do I need a mic? Can you, yes, sir. Please speak into the microphone That's and uh, identify yourself. Uh, sure, you just did. I did, but for everyone else. Stelzer. Is that working? Yes. I'm Erwin Stelzer of the Hudson Institute. Um, I've been jousting with conservatives on this question of uh, security and, and not just having a knee-jerk reaction to the fact that environmentalists uh, want to get us off fossil fuels. I might say, uh, Mr. Lutz, that um, I thought you were as unkindly treated by CNBC this morning as anything Fox might have arranged. Uh, so you apparently do have uh, a problem selling this to conservatives, uh, uh, and I agree. Here's the problem, um, and perhaps you can help us. What uh, Fred is suggesting uh, is that somebody is going to have to pick a winning technology 
and um, somehow make it happen. That because oil markets are distorted, we can't rely only on the private sector to do that. Right. Okay, so now we're into government subsidizing what it perceives to be winners. That's a conservative difficulty. Se and second, when we call for an energy policy, that smacks of planning. Now, from what I've heard today, is this problem solved, since this is a security problem, by having General Conway and General Kelly suggest that the funding for these technologies come out of the military budget? Who are you directing the question to? Well, uh, first of all, Fred, I wonder how you get over this question of the picking of winners. And second of all, I wonder if our military friends would accept the burden of funding these <coughs> perceived winners from the military budget since this is a security problem and markets can't seem to handle it. Well, first of all, everybody in this room that has a, uh, on your person at the moment, a cell phone, raise your hand. Is there anybody in that? Are you telling me that there are a large group of people back there that don't have <laughs> cell phones? Everybody that owns one, raise your hand. It's everybody in the room, isn't it? If you don't, you're one of a tiny minority. That, that, <clears throat> that issue has been decided. Every cell phone, regardless of whether you, you have an Android or an iPhone or whatever the case may be, is powered by a lithium ion battery. So there's nobody that's arguing today over whether lead acid batteries or whatever the case may be are going to be a source of power. That issue has been decided. It's much more akin to the situation in the early days of aviation when the United States uh, realized that there was a high likelihood that these tiny little uh, airplanes that had uh, been so important in World War I were likely, because of technology, to become self-sustaining in a commercial way themselves. And so what the government did is to try to help that technology cross the chasm by uh, offering airmail contracts to, to incent the manufacturers to build new uh, productive airplanes. And eventually Douglas did that with the DC three and the famous C-47 variant of it, <clears throat> which was a, a big part of our victory in World War II. So what the government needs to do today is, in, in my opinion, not try to pick winners and losers among General Motors or, or uh, Ford or whatever the case may be, but to provide the incentives for the private sector to build vehicles and help drive the cost of the, uh, of the battery down and increase the range so that for light duty vehicles there is an alternative to fossil fuels. It's not going to replace it. Uh, plenty of uh, internal combustion engines are going to be built for a long time. So I think that's different than picking a winner and, and uh, it's certainly not the same as the government um, putting money into Solyndra or putting money into solar or what have you, <coughs> that is more of an environmental issue. We have lots of, of power uh, generating fuels in the United States. We have coal, we have natural gas, we have geothermal, uh, we have um, uh, uh, certainly solar and, and wind, but they are a tiny fraction. We have nuclear and so forth. So we don't have to pick a winner or loser of the, of the power uh, sector, which is the primary propulsive uh, capability. All we have to do is to provide the incentive to try to drive this uh, technology into scale production, which I think, and Bob Lutz here has forgotten more about this than I'll ever know, but uh, I think that the trajectory of the battery density and the price and range of the vehicles in a few years are going to be cost competitive on their own. But there is no competitive um, technology that can fight the lithium ion battery revolution that we've all powered with our adoption of cellular telephony. 
me turn it over to Bob Lutz very quickly before turning to General Kelly on the uh, question of uh, movement of uh, technology in the battery <coughs> sector and where it's going. Well, uh, anyone who's uh, worked with electric vehicles or worked in the battery industry knows that there are uh, significant, significant breakthroughs uh, in the wings, uh, both at the national labs level, university level, and a lot of uh, private startup companies. And the work is concentrated to some extent on the cathodes, which um, by Im improving the efficiency of the cathode, you could probably double the uh, energy density of today's lithium ion, but also on the horizon is something called lithium sulfur, uh, which is about four years away and will um, improve energy density by a factor, a factor of five. So what today is a 40 mile range battery in a volt becomes a 200 mile battery. A little further on the horizon is lithium air, which today demonstrates already 10 times the energy density of today's lithium ion. There's one tiny problem. Nobody's figured out how to recharge it yet. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a primary battery. It, it works once and then it's disposed. Uh, but I think the recharging thing will be settled. Um, some historic figures. Uh, when we started working on the Chevy Volt, uh, lithium ion was quoted for automotive use was quoted at $2,000 per kilowatt hour. Through negotiation with various battery manufacturers at the time, uh, we got it down to 1,000 per kilowatt hour and then 950 per kilowatt hour. Uh, meanwhile, um, it's come far enough down on the cost curve to the last I checked, and it's probably gone down some more since then, it was $350 per kilowatt hour and still dropping. To the point that Fred made about it'll soon be self-sustaining, um, I am a, a board member of a company called Via, which takes General Motors produced full-size pickup trucks and full-size vans, uh, minus the engine and transmission, installs lithium ion batteries, an electric motor, and a very, very small fuel efficient V6 engine. Works just like a Chevy Volt, 40 miles electric, and then the rest of the time you're on uh, you're on the piston engine replenishing the, the battery. These things today, there's a heavy, heavy, heavy demand from fleets, including Federal Express, uh, because the combined monthly amortization of the vehicle, which admittedly is more expensive than a conventional pickup, plus the fuel cost, monthly fuel cost, the sum of those two is less than the monthly amortization plus the fuel cost of a conventional pickup. And that's at $3.50 a gallon. At $4 and $4 plus, of course, the equation tips a even farther. So here is a whole vehicle category that already is not dependent on government incentives. And in fact, from a purely private enterprise, <coughs> which one's the best solution for me already pays off for, uh, for fleet use. So I think we can all be very optimistic that um, in, in a very brief time, mm. government tax credits will no longer be necessary for the support of electrified vehicles, which, by the way, one more little reminder as I get a chance to present. Uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly has a larger audience than I do, but um, Obama gets blamed for the $7,500 federal tax credit for buying an electric vehicle. That policy, that, that tax credit, in fact, was created under George W. Bush, just to set the record straight. I'm not sure that tax credit would have many fans here otherwise. <coughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me turn it back to General, General Kelly and ask about, uh, or, or to turn it back to Erwin Stelzer's question about the military assuming uh, some of the costs. Uh, yeah, can I stand up? Absolutely. <laughs> You probably, probably noticed when I walked in, I'm having a little problem walking. Uh, that's what you had. When I saw the uh, surgeon at Bethesda, he said, what have you been doing? That back is the worst back I've ever seen. And I said, well, you know, you don't jump out of airplanes a couple of hundred times and think you're going to come back clean. So <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not asking your opinion. Uh, what can you do to fix it? And he said, well, he said, when my team sees that back, they're going to think it's unfixable.
But with that said, let me sit down, <laughs> and then I'll answer your question. With that said, I said I will get, make a deal with you. Whoop. I'll make a deal with you. I will let you operate if, if you can do it up on the eighth floor, which is the orthopedic ward for the young kids coming home, as opposed to the VIP suites down on the second floor for all of the admirals and generals who like VIP suites. So he said yes, he could do that. And it was one of the best decisions I think I've made in my 37 years as a Marine to see and be with these young kids. One night uh, I woke up with great pain. I looked over and there's a young Marine standing there. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm guarding you. I said, from what? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked over and here he is standing there guarding me on one leg. And I mentioned mention that story only because I think every time I meet a wonderful group like this, I want you to know that there's young kids out there who are doing a great job for this country in every way. But to answer your question, the answer, generally speaking, and there always will be exceptions, is no. The budget now is so low that if you start taking out any more, any more for either people or equipment, you're going to de degrade the combat capabilities of the United States of America. And that, and that is my opinion, but I think it's supported by facts. Yep. As a young two-star, I was sent by the Marine Corps to the European Command, and I gave 52 presentations on the capabilities of the Marine Corps operating in that theater of operations. And one of the things I was more focused on than anything, I know Marines can fight, is the question of how you get there. And what I saw was we were having a very difficult time in determining how we were going to get there. As an example, I was up in Buda in Norway, and a great big Norwegian Air Force general got very annoyed with some of the things I was saying. He came over and he punched me in the chest. He said, you can't come to my country and tell me how I'm going to fight my war. Well, his boss, who was a three-star, told him to sit down, and he reminded him, you see, any time, he said, you've got to have something to fight with before you can fight. And I thought that was a great answer for somebody who really was getting very antagonistic. The point of that story is that the following year, I went to the Pacific area and gave about 50 presentations on the Marine Corps and its capability. <laughs> and from that, we built a building block of very, I think, unique and historic capabilities. Number one was essential during the Gulf War, and that was the maritime prepositioning ships. Those ships could be pre-located -pre -pre offshore or in close proximity to the target area. <coughs> They're completely loaded with supplies and equipment for 30 days. So your transit time and all is cut, cut down to practically nothing. And uh, we also, we uh, built 50 more C-5 airplanes. We re-winged all of the uh, 141s. We did a lot of things to improve our capability to get there. But now then the issue was, once you get there, how are you going to fight? And I think the Marine Corps during that period of time and now has made such a 100% improvement. I don't know how many of you have ever known some of our commandants, but we had one who was a, a habit of being particularly nasty if you weren't telling him what he wanted to hear. It wasn't one of us, uh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in a meeting one day, I told him what he didn't want to hear. And he got very antagonistic because I did, and what I sent, said essentially is, if you do that, we have to sell off 10,000 Marines just to pay that bill. And he didn't believe me until we proved it to him. And so with that, then we had to borrow money from Peter to pay Paul. And from what I'm reading now that's coming out of the Pentagon, 
is they are really starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel. And so the answer to what your question is, yes, there are probably some items that you can get along without for a period of time. On the other hand, I don't think there are many. And so if this great country of ours is going to be a, be a global force and have capabilities that are global, then we've got to pay the penalty that it costs us. And don't expect that it'll come from the young troops who can hardly afford it. I heard a story once, and I'm not invading your territory, but when you were commander in the Gulf War, Iraq to the Gulf War, in the Iraqi War, mm -hmm. that your column of trucks was some 60 miles long? Total, I believe that. Trucks, a column 60 miles long. Imagining the refueling capability, and I'm told, again, Jim, if I'm stepping on your toes, that because we had in-flight refuelers, and we're the only service that does, we could land those on the, tr on the uh, roads and offload the fuel into our containers at the, yeah, at we the we did that. unit level. And that's what we did. So of all of the services, and let me be very uh, candid about this, of all of the services, I think we are probably the most that is, have care and loving care for the dollar bill and the, what it costs to go to war. There are no flourishes, nothing that you, that you can say is a, uh, something you shouldn't have. And so the point is, the answer to the question, I would see, be very, very doubtful unless we got specific to see if there are some things that you think might be a, a trade-off. But I would doubt it very seriously. Let me turn to Fred Smith. Well, first of all, let me, let me put this in uh, perspective. On, uh, I'm, I'm fully uh, in favor of a, of a, a strong uh, military. I believe in the axiom based on my own military service. If, if you need a platoon, send a battalion. If you need a battalion, send a regiment. I mean, anybody that's been in the military understands that. You want to deal with, with overwhelming force, and, and we are, we're feeling the best military in the history of the world. But the Energy Security Leadership Council's recommendation and its offshoot, the Electrification Coalition, that's worked on this issue, Correct me if I'm wrong about this, Robbie. The incentives which were recommended total over a 10-year period about $15 billion. Is that close? Over 10 years. And, and uh, it, 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 it is a tiny fraction of, of the money we spend on the military, which is $550 billion a year or something like that. That doesn't count. The, the cost of, of combat operations. This country has spent in Iraq and Afghanistan well north of a trillion dollars. Uh, a prominent conservative mentioned to me this morning said, well, the original Afghanistan war wasn't really about oil. That's, that's incorrect. As I said earlier, Osama bin Laden declared war on the United States in 1998 because our troops were in Saudi Arabia, and our troops were in Saudi Arabia because of the Gulf War I, and President George Herbert Walker Bush said it as plain as it could be, the war was about oil. Alan Greenspan has repeated in his book, President Nixon thought about invading Saudi Arabia after the first Arab oil embargo. So this is you're talking about $15 billion over 10 years to try to incent move, movement towards electrification. We at FedEx have also supported uh, either vehicle mileage taxes or an increase in the fuel tax in order to fund the appropriate infrastructure in this country. We won't raise the tax. Our infrastructure is going to the devil. The cost of, of congestion, I don't have to tell anybody who lives in the Washington, D.C. area about this, we're being penny-wise and pound-foolish. So you're not talking about a wholesale cavitation of the American military by providing these incentives, which we've recommended, and they can be funded in a lot of ways, but what they need to be looked at is part of the overall strategic issues that confront the United States, not a free market issue not a picking winners and a losers, but in the overall context. Thank you. Let 
me turn it over to uh, another question from the audience. Alfred Moses, get a microphone up here. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Mr. Smith, you should be feeling pretty good. First of all, you didn't mention it, but your, your company is one of the most efficient users of fossil fuels, always looking to get vehicles that are more fuel efficient. You're the leader in the industry, and you'd be commended for it. But if you take your five points, greater oil production, we've embarked on that rather, rather dramatically in, in the last four years. In terms of natural gas, our, our production has moved up so that the cost of natural gas today is what, $2? Right around $2 per thousand cubic feet. Against almost $7, 6 to $7 a few years ago. $13 at the turn of the century. Well, I, I don't go back that far. You don't look like you did either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, over, I've overstated. Electricity, uh, Mr. Lutz has told us about electric cars. We're moving in that direction. We're not quite there yet, but we're starting to moving in that direction. Biofuels, yes. Uh, not quite there yet, but we're moving in that direction. And lastly, fuel efficiency. Uh, if I recall, recall correctly, President Bush's goal was 35 miles a gallon. President Obama's goal was over 50 miles a gallon. So there's been dramatic improvement. Uh, I've even seen figures in reputable newspapers, thought to be left of center, such as the New York Times, that we will be fuel neutral in terms of imports by the year 20. Twenty, and we may even be exporting fossil fuels a decade or so later. So, aren't we really marching now to the Smith drum and accomplishing many of the things that you've been advocating, and probably in a shorter time frame than you foresaw when you first got the gas? Well, I think the answer to that question is yes. I think <clears throat> one of the very best thing that's happened has been this incredible uh, technology that's been deployed uh, for natural gas, and now. Uh, oil uh, production and uh, as I mentioned I believe that the position of the Energy Security Leadership Council on uh, new fuel efficiency standards was a very big part of the Bush administration's decision to uh, to to embrace them in the 2007 uh, Energy uh, Act we certainly worked on it hard at the time so yes we're moving in the right direction but I'll tell you one of the reasons that, that I agreed to do these sessions today, and it gets to, uh, to, uh, to exactly the point that Bob Lutz was, was talking about. Our national dialogue today is we take one incident about a, a lithium ion bi battery fire three weeks after a government crash text, uh, test that was caused because they didn't take the fluid out of the vehicle. Yet there are 275,000 internal combustion engines that uh, catch on fire every, every year. Now, when you've got that type of hyperbole and that type of misinformation, the, the public, well, I don't know, but I know this much. We're here to try to correct some of those misconceptions. But that is doing a disservice to the American public that doesn't understand the magnitude of the problem and that these technologies are safe. Now listen, we, we know lithium ion battery technology at FedEx very well. We transport them in our airplanes. They can combust under certain circumstances, but they uh, have not in the automotive sector because of the tremendous amount of R&D and manufacturing prowess that Bob put into that product and presumably Toyota's put into theirs and so forth. So we are definitely moving in the right direction. We're down 5% year over year. But until we get to that point, and I, my guess is that people think that we'll be a next net oil exporter are probably a bit over optimistic based on the depletion rates of the oil that's coming up because of fracking. But until we get to the point where we are much less dependent on foreign petroleum, the foreign policy options that, that the successors to General Conway and General Kelly have to deal with are tremendously uh, uh, circumscribed in what we can do. We have to, just as, as uh, the General told you at the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're now talking about the economic implications of 
whether we do this, that, and the other thing. And if we have another oil crisis, it will put the United States back into significant recession. And as I said, based on my experience over these 40 years, given the demand growth of China and India and the emerging economies, from this point forward, as long as we have this kind of imbalance, as soon as the United States starts showing any type of significant economic growth, I can almost assure you that that economic growth and wealth will be expropriated by an increase in oil prices because it would not be <laughs> in the best interest of the people that control the oil, mar oil markets through a cartel to do anything other than that. <coughs> so much for your lucid and succinct remarks. Mr. Smith, you commented on geopolitics with Japan issues. And um, when I look at uh, Japan, in light of Fukushima uh, accident, Japanese government shut down all nuclear power plants. My question is A, um, Japanese will confront with a severe electric shortage this coming summer. Do you have a, a view on how Japanese government substitute uh, the shortage of electricity? And B, uh, dealing with um, uh, Taiwan and the EU issues. When I look at EU energy mix, in France, it's 75 percent is mixed with the nuclear plant, and, and in the UK, it's 20 percent. But in light of Fukushima accident, Jap uh, Germany club, German government, it changed its policy in nuclear uh, uh, plant. Do you have any views how other EU member states might change the new uh, energy mix? Thank you very much. Well, my view and the view of the Energy Security Leadership Council is that nuclear power generation is something that the United States should embrace and, and, and continue. Uh, in the history of human technologies producing power, I don't think any have the, the, the safety record that nuclear does. I mean, there have been far more people lost uh, in coal mining accidents and refinery fires and one thing or another than, than, uh, than nuclear. I think the, the real problem in uh, the horrible tragedy in Japan, and of course we were very heavily involved in that. FedEx uh, served Japan, and we tried to help in every way we could taking supplies. So I know the extent of the, of the devastation. But the fundamental problem in Fukushima was the unfortunate decision to locate the nuclear power plants where there could be a tsunami that that uh, uh, kept the power plants from being uh, safely cooled down. So I don't have any doubt about the fact whether the, the, the German government has made their decision um, sticks or not, I, I would doubt, to tell you the truth. I think the, the, uh, the advantages of nuclear power, particularly for people concerned with emissions and so forth, uh, there's a high likelihood that there will be a lot of nuclear power utilized in the next 20 or 30 years, if not in Europe and the United States, certainly in China and elsewhere. Yep. Steve Cheney with the American Security Project. Uh, let me thank all of you for your service to our core and to our country right up front. Um, I'm with the American Security Project, and we cover topics that are virtually identical to this. Uh, Bob, your comments about the politicization of this stuff, Secretary Mavis went up on the Hill last week and was grilled hard about the Navy's use of biofuels. Um, when I think his decision and the administration's decision to use biofuels is the right one. But my question is to Fred Smith on FedEx. You have so many airplanes, now that technology's been proven, biofuels work in airplanes. Do you have any plans to use biofuels? And secondly, one of the big problems with that industry, of course, is funding on the technology and development side of the front end, it would seem to me from the industry side, it would be a good thing to invest in. Well, uh, the industry is working very hard on this. Uh, Boeing and, and Airbus, who, who agree on very few things, uh, just in the last week, along with Embraer of Brazil, uh, announced a consortium to work on, on biofuels. Uh, Lufthansa, Virgin, KLM, uh, I think uh, Alaska Airlines, Qantas, uh, many commercial carriers have flown airplanes powered 
with uh, uh, fuel mixed with uh, Jet A, uh, and the fuels made from Jatropha, Camelina, algae, and so forth. That's all been certified. As I mentioned uh, earlier today, the Navy has flown the F-18. They call it the Green Hornet. So we have two or three initiatives at FedEx. I personally believe, and this too has been derided uh, to some degree by the popular press and the conservative um, uh, wings, and again, I am a conservative, so uh, let me reemphasize that, <laughs> about the president's remarks on algae. But I think the president is absolutely right. The, the most likely biofuel that can be produced at scale is likely to come from algae. Exxon has invested $600 million with Craig Ventner, the individual who decoded the, the genome. Um, uh, we're working with an Australian company uh, that seems to have some pretty good uh, technology to make uh, uh, jet fuel feedstock out of uh, uh, algae produced in bioreactors. Uh, algae is prolific, both in sea and, and, and static water. Uh, it can be made in bioreactors. It doesn't compete like corn does for crops and arable land and so forth. So if we get lucky and, you know, the right chemistry uh, can be put together, I, th I think biofuels is definitely part of the mix. But it's strictly at this point in time a matter of, of the scale production cost. It's not a technical issue anymore. We have time for one last question. I will turn it over to my colleague, Lee Lane, sitting patiently. Thank you. Um, I, just went all the way in the back. I noticed from uh, the economic analysis that uh, the council has, uh, has authorized, um, you call for, and, and Mr. Smith mentioned this this morning, you call for the phasing out eventually of the subsidies to the uh, electric vehicles, and you also, in your program, call for a restructuring of the uh, of the biofuel subsidies. Uh, actually, the, the subsidy is, has gone away, but but we but we still have we still have a mandate. And I guess my question then is fundamentally of a political nature, and it is: it seems awfully difficult for the U.S. government to get rid of a subsidy once it's created. And, and so is it really realistic? I, I mean, I agree these are good policies. It would be desirable. But it, don't we run the risk if we create a subsidy uh, that it stays there even after the need for it has disappeared? Look, <coughs> we operate in a political system that cannot, cannot raise the price of fuel. Uh, through taxation. We have, we have 18 cents a gallon federal tax on fuel, which is ridiculous. Uh, uh, the, the average in Europe is $4.50, so that the gallon in Europe is $9 a gallon. At $9 a gallon, you need no government subsidies to get people into alternative fuel vehicles. In fact, the Chevrolet Volt, when we announced it, its sister car, the Opel Ampera, uh, it got 8,000 orders the first day with zero government subsidies because at $9 a gallon it provides its own incentive. But in the states, we, the political process is such that we can't use the market mechanism of fuel price to drive demand for these alternative fuel vehicles. So we leave the fuel price, we leave taxation where it is, and then we have to find a somewhat artificial means to incent customers to look at these vehicles. As I say, if I were Emperor of the United States, the only position for which I qualify by virtue of my foreign birth, um, <laughs> I would raise the fuel tax in the United States by 25 cents a gallon per year so that people making a purchase decision would say, Wow, it's four dollars this year, four twenty-five next year, four fifty the year after that. You know what? We'd better buy a compact this time. In other words, you would have a predictable rise in fuel prices. The problem with and, and Fred and I had, you know, when we when this when his commission 
first recommended uh, strict fuel economy guidelines um, as, an, as a representative of an automobile manufacturer. I was clearly opposed to it because CAFE or corporate average fuel economy regulation is the equivalent of combating national obesity by forcing clothing manufacturers to manufacture only small sizes. Whereas what you should be doing is raising the price of food. Um, so it's a, it's a roundabout way of getting at it. It, it. Is it totally free market? No, it isn't. But it'll have to suffice because we're not using the free market mechanism to get people to voluntarily restrict their use of gasoline. So we have to come in with, a, with an artificial substitute called a subsidy. I think if fuel prices continue to rise, we will see uh, continued much faster rises in the efficiency of the U.S. fleet than you could ever achieve via regulation. So if we get to $5 a gallon and $5.50 a gallon, you're going to see a mass transition to small cars, to diesels, to hybrid vehicles. In other words, people will be more and more willing to pay for the technology. I, I don't like the system of artificially low fuel prices and then compensate it by subsidies any better than anybody else. But since the fuel price and federal fuel taxation is the political third rail in the United States, no politician in his right mind is ever going to mention fuel taxes. We have to use a different mechanism. And you know, we all have to live in the world as it is. We can fight it, argue about it. But at the end of the day, to achieve progress, we have to do what works. Be pragmatists and do what works. Just one fact, the Energy Security Leadership Council was prepared to support an increase in fuel prices just as Bob Lutz described, you know, on a graduated scale to get to the same place and supported the, the, uh, uh, the re-imposition of fuel efficiency standards and incentives for uh, electric vehicles since it was impossible to achieve politically. I didn't know that. Thank you. Makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> you got on, and, and on that happy note, yeah. let me just uh, thank our very uh, distinguished panelists, uh, General Kelly, General Conway, Bob West, Chris Smith, also uh, the communications teams at both uh, SAFE and Hudson and the uh, wonderful folks at C-SPAN for uh, pulling together today. Thank you. thank you very much. Nice to see you. Yeah, how you doing?